afternoon, friends, and good morning to the good folks on the West Coast. My name is Joshua Dubois, and I lead President Obama's faith-based office, where we connect with faith-based and nonprofit organizations around the country to better serve people in need. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this White House Google Plus Hangout on the important topic of human trafficking. As you know, the president uh, offered some major remarks on this issue this week, and we're here to discuss them, discuss the president's deliverables and our partnerships with organizations across the country and around the world on this issue. We invite you and encourage you to participate in this conversation. You can watch us live at whitehouse.gov slash live. Again, that's whitehouse.gov slash live. And to ask a question, just head on over to Twitter and use the hashtag pound WH hangout. Again, that's pound WH hangout. So join in the conversation. We're so pleased to have uh, NGOs and, and faith leaders and other folks from across the country join us. But first, we're really honored to have some special guests from the White House. Um, we're going to hear from Tina Chin. Tina is the chief of staff to First Lady Michelle Obama, and she's also the executive director of the White House Council on Women and Girls and one of our nation's leading advocates fighting for women and girls across the country and around the world. Tina's going to provide an overview of our domestic accomplishments, and then I'll introduce our next guest. So, but first, Tina, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Joshua, uh, and thank you all for joining us um, for this Google Hangout. Um, and thanks to many of you who, who I think probably tuned in, I hope, to watch the president's speech on Tuesday, where he gave really a major address lending his voice um, to combat you know, human trafficking and really name it for what it is, which is modern day slavery, both importantly, not only internationally, where this is often discussed, um, but domestically, and really speaking quite frankly about the issues that we have right here at home and the issues we need to combat. Um, and the list of um, deliverables that he called upon the federal government to come forward and work on really touch in both of those areas. Um, first, he importantly um, signed that day an executive order. Um, and my colleague Samantha Power will go into in a little more detail. But essentially what it does is to strengthen protections in our federal contracting process to really make sure that when we, as the, one of the largest buyer of goods and services in the world, the federal government, go out into the marketplace, that our contractors are making sure that um, human trafficking is not involved in their supply chains. Secondly, um, we're going to be issuing new tools and training to identify and assist trafficking victims. You know, we know that, importantly, victims need to be treated as victims, not as criminals um, by our system. And we need to make sure that anyone who comes in contact with them, whether it's educators, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's child welfare workers or other workers in the variety of juvenile justice and other systems that come into, in touch with um, victims of human trafficking, that they are really treated and given the services that they need. So we're going to work on a, and developing tools and disseminating those and training for everyone who comes in contact um, with these victims. We're also going to increase resources for victims of human trafficking. You know, we know that we need comprehensive services for these victims. Um, and in association with that, we were really pleased to announce on Tuesday a partnership between Humanity United um, and the Goldman Sachs Foundation to launch a $6 million Partnership for Freedom Innovation mm -hmm. Awards. And that's to challenge local communities to come up with services and comprehensive collaborations to address the needs of victims. Um, and then when we have those um, in hand, we'll be able to have best practices that we can scale up and extend across the country. Um, also as part of that, the president um, announced that we are going to establish a new presidential award for extraordinary efforts to combat trafficking in persons. And we're going to award that annually to really recognize the work in this area and incentivize others to follow in kind um, in developing those kinds of practices. Um, and then finally, at the federal government level, we are going to develop a comprehensive plan for future action. Now, the president, we already have um, a very active president's interagency task force to monitor and combat human trafficking in persons. Um, that's been uh, led by Ambassador Luce, the DeBaca over at the State Department, um, that has the active involvement of all of the federal agencies involved in this area. And at the President's direction, we're going to continue that work um, and extend it and develop a very comprehensive plan 
that'll work with our intelligence community, with our justice um, uh, arms, with our social service arms to comprehensively attack this problem. Um, just to anticipate one of the questions I know has come through is what are we doing with you know, international trafficking and, and, and some of the international crime issues. That effort right now that we've already started, which is to link existing networks of state, federal, and local law enforcement who already identify other kinds of crimes and cooperate together. We're gonna, we've already started to establish the networks that allow them to be in touch with advocates, to be in touch with information that's out there. Um, to address um, the, the issue of human trafficking. Um, and also as part of that, as we announced on Tuesday, um, we've already started an effort with the leadership of the White House Office of Science, Technology, and Policy and the White House Council on Women and Girls, um, an effort that brings together the technology industry and advocates and law enforcement all together with us um, to turn the tables on technology. We know all too well the technology has been misused um, um, as a tool by the traffickers, given its anonymity and its ease, especially in the sex trafficking of minors, um, and especially here in the United States. Um, and we are going to, uh, we've challenged, we've already started that dialogue um, with players across all those sectors to come up with innovative ways to address that and combat it. And then beyond that, to actually use technology to reach victims, to provide easy ways on their smartphones. We announced a technology app challenge over the weekend to challenge app developers to develop new smartphone applications um, that we can use to actually reach victims and allow them to quite easily get in touch with services and know, as the president said so powerfully on Tuesday, that they're not alone. You're not alone, if any of you are listening to this. Um, we hear you. We are really with you. And we are in this for the long term to address your need. Thanks, Joshua. Well, thank you so much, Tina. And thank you for the tremendous work the Council on Women and Girls, along with the Domestic Policy Council and others, are doing on this issue. But now for an international focus, we're honored to have with us Samantha Power. Samantha is Senior Director for Multilateral Affairs at the White House National Security Staff and has really been one of the global leaders on atrocity prevention. And I can't think of something that's more of an atrocity than human trafficking. So, Samantha, we'd love to hear the international components from you. Great, Joshua. Uh, well, first, let me say what an honor it is uh, to be here, not only with Tina and Joshua, who do such uh, uh, important work, God's work, really, within uh, the White House, but also uh, to be here with Malika and Randy and Kay and, and Caitlin and Natalie. Um, I mean, we really, without you, um, this conversation and these efforts would be in a very different place. Uh, it's just phenomenal, the work that you've done and the way you've mobilized um, America, really, uh, at a very grassroots level. Um, I, I'd start just with a, uh, the, a couple points I made to some of you in advance of the President's speech, which is that I, I do think that this entire effort is rooted in two of his cornerstone uh, principles that he brings uh, to all of his foreign policy. Uh, one is dignity, just the essence uh, of our foreign policy needs to be rooted in promoting dignity around the world. What greater indignity is there than to have your freedom taken away from you, to be trafficked, to be a bonded laborer, to be um, forced into a brothel, et cetera. I mean, it's just an affront to the, the very concept of dignity. And I think what we've seen, and it's been so gratifying the last day or so, is to see the degree to which uh, people who have suffered through this horrible experience and emerged on the other side, and people we're not hearing from, who are still trapped in these impossible circumstances, but the degree to which the president's saying, I see you, we see you, uh, it has really touched something, I think, very deep um, in this uh, community. And, and it's, it's, again, just, just one step. We're, we we want to make sure that that message is sent day in, day out um, by us in the governmental community and, and by those of you who care about this issue. Uh, the second principle is just leading from example, as Tina alluded to, we have to get our own house in order. Uh, in addition to going bilaterally to governments where trafficking is a major problem within their own borders, we have so much more credibility, we have so much more of a capacity for cooperation if we make the resources available in our own house, and, and that's uh, the essence of what we're talking about. I'll just touch on um, two things, because Tina co covered a number of things that have uh, transnational uh, dimensions as well, including, for instance, prosecution and relying on our, our uh, uh, Department of Justice and DHS and other resources here to get at trafficking where American citizens are involved or where people are being brought from overseas to this country. Um, but in order to do right in our foreign policy, we, we also need a, a thicker evidentiary foundation. And so one of the things the President 
uh, announced this week and has has made possible, um, uh, you know, over the time that we've been here, is stepped up intelligence collection. And that means both in our embassies on the diplomatic side, because those are the people often out interfacing, uh, you know, with people who have survived these practices or with the knowledge of where law enforcement is breaking down in other countries, um, but also in, in terms of, you know, more traditional forms of intelligence, the traditional intelligence community. So we're actually monitoring uh, using all of our resources to, to look at what's going on in other countries. This is an important, I think, uh, enabling uh, evidentiary um, surge, shall we say, or uh, uptick that I think is going to help uh, with our other efforts. And then finally, uh, Tina touched upon the EO. It's no secret that as the United States has become, uh, it became involved, for instance, in Iraq or uh, in Afghanistan, that we have large bases and we have federal uh, contract, recipients of federal contracts and subcontracts. Uh, that are active on those bases, and the oversight is very difficult to come by uh, in light of how sprawling those bases are, and the use of third country nationals has become very prevalent. The EO is a response to that and, and, a, and a range of other uh, challenges that we see also on the horizon. But the goal of the EO uh, is to ensure that uh, federal uh, recipients of large overseas federal contracts and subcontracts are looking and scrutinizing and making sure uh, that the people who come to work and to, to uh, uh, enact those contracts are not themselves the victims of trafficking. So uh, compliance plans are going to be required for those large overseas federal contractees. New practices that we fear are prevalent out there, like recruitment uh, fees and the confiscation of identity documents, fraudulent recruitment, uh, those have now been prohibited with this executive order. So we've long had a zero tolerance uh, policy toward uh, uh, the use of trafficked labor you know, in our contracts, but what this executive order does is it really is going to drill down on that and make sure we have the mechanisms for actually bringing about zero tolerance. So it's going to be a long journey. We've got the regulations and the rules and so forth that we want to interact with you to figure out how best to scope. Um, but the step that he has taken this week, I think, is a, is a critical piece of enforcement in making your work uh, uh, supplemented, complemented uh, throughout the crannies of the U.S. government by what we're doing here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Joshua, if I might, I, there were three, I want to acknowledge there are three private sector initiatives, too, that, that I overlooked in my comments and that we highlighted on Tuesday as well, because um, we really had seen step up on this issue across sectors. Um, one is, as, as the president noted in his speech, the Global Business Coalition Against Trafficking um, is a business-to-business -business network that's going to mobilize its members to fight trafficking um, and identify and develop best practices and, for example, eliminate trafficking in, in supply chains. The U.S. Travel Association is compiling an anti-trafficking toolkit. Um, since we know within the travel industry, there's a lot of, of marketing um, and solicitation that goes on there. Um, and then finally, Johns Hopkins University's Bloomberg School of Public Health um, is doing a cross-sector and cross-disciplinary research partnership um, with the Goldman Sachs Foundation and the Advisory Council on Child Trafficking. Um, and they're going to do um, great research and evidence-based work on the prevention of sex trafficking and treatment that will help inform the best practices and the expansion and scaling up of services um, that I referred to earlier. So thanks. Great private sector commitments. Thank you so much, Tina. Now we're going to go to some of our special guests and then very quickly move to receive questions from you all. But we're so excited to have some leading folks on this issue participating in the Hangout. Um, we're going to move to them now. If I could ask folks to keep your comments to a minute or less so we can go to the questions uh, from the Google Plus Hangout. But first, we're honored to have here Malika Sada Sar, um, the Executive Director of the Human Rights Project for Girls. Malika, uh, we'd love to hear from you and let us know a little bit about the work you do. Oh. Oops. Yep. Malika may be having some audio issues. I think you may be having some audio issues there. We're going to work on that now and move to our next guest, but we'll be right back to you, Malika. Okay, thank you. We're coming back because we need to hear about the work you're doing. Um, next, uh, we have Natalie Grant. Uh, Natalie is one of my favorite Christian music artists, and she's also the founder of Abolition International. Natalie, tell us how someone involved in the entertainment industry gets, uh, gets connected to an, a critical issue like this. You know, back in 2004, I took a trip that I say forever wrecked my life. Um, I was walking down the streets of Mumbai, and I saw, um, with my own eyes, little children for sale on the street. 
Mm. And it's just something that has forever marked my life. Um, coming back to America, I heard a news report 30 days later of something that was happening in my own community of a brothel broken up of young girls. And I thought, how can we just go across the world if we don't start by going across the street? Mm. Um, so I started an organization back in 2005 called Abolition International. Um, and our mission is very clear. Our mission is to combat sex trafficking through awareness, through accreditation, um, and through a restorative process that calls on the faith-based community to live up to the standard that's been put before us to stand up for the oppressed. And what will our answer be? We should be on the front lines of the restorative piece of this process. So we're writing um, standards of care that would say, okay, all of these fabulous shelters that are, are, are popping up, you do have to have a quality standard of care that would meet the whole of the person, their, their physical, their mental, and their spiritual needs. Thank you so much, Natalie. You all are certainly stepping up in a major way, and thank you for lifting up the voice of the faith community on this issue. We also have with us uh, Randy Newcomb. Randy is the president and CEO of Humanity United, one of our critical partners on this issue. Randy, tell us a little bit about Humanity United and what you guys do. Thank you, Joshua. and. Uh... Let me, let me just say in advance uh, my thanks to the White House and to Tina and to Samantha and you, Joshua, for what on, on any account has been probably one of the most historic weeks, I think, in the, in the entire movement. So it's, it's, it's just thrilling to be a part of this. Humanity United is, is a private foundation that's based in San Francisco. We're dedicating to building peace and advancing human freedom. And in particular, uh, related to this week, as Tina just mentioned, uh, we were, were partnering with the White House and the Goldman Sachs uh, 10,000 Women Initiative to create the uh, Partnership for Freedom, which is a $6 million challenge fund to support community-level interventions that can be scaled nationally, but also ultimately scaled globally to really assist survivors. And today, I really have the opportunity to join the conversation literally across the street from probably Tina and Samantha in our Washington, D.C. office. And we're, Humanity United is coming to this to really help to organize the philanthropic community and uh, federal agencies to use our resources in the most impactful way possible that we can. And so we're committed to standing up this challenge award. We're going to be looking at sustainable housing, comprehensive care and management for minors, and law enforcement engagement with survivors to really change that calculation. So I'm really Really excited to talk about this challenge award and how this might stand up and support NGOs across the U.S. That is very exciting, and the challenge sounds wonderful, and I know a lot of folks around the country are going to take up the charge. Um, now we're going to hear from Caitlin Rulin. Caitlin uh, just graduated from Appalachian State University um, and has been active with International Justice Mission on campuses around the country. Caitlin, talk to us about a student's perspective on this issue. Yeah, for sure. So my journey with the fight against human trafficking started, I went on a mission trip um, to Mexico in the rural areas and worked with youth and met a lot of girls there after my sophomore year of college who had been either sexually or physically abused. And that just kind of pierced my heart. And from there out, I knew I wanted to learn about the topic more, so I decided to major in international and comparative politics in college, and it was in my junior year when I took a human rights class and a politics on developing nations class that I really became more informed and felt empowered to get involved with NGOs, and then I attended Passion during the um, winter break of my senior year of college in Atlanta at the conference and saw what IJAM was doing and how they were finally um, an organization that was giving students a way to really step up and take action and just learn. And so from there out, um, it was just on my heart to start a campus movement, which IJAM offers. Um, and so I raised up a group at our school of between 100 and 200 students who were ready to fight and raise funds, awareness and education on the issues. And from there out, um, I've just been blessed to have the chance to intern with International Justice Mission. And there I got to mentor and lead about 10 to 15 other campuses into the fight against human trafficking where they raised up similar movements. So as a student, it's just an honor to partner with these organizations that are present in this conversation and the White House as they, we just feel great as a generation that our voices are being heard and not for ourselves, but for those who actually don't have a voice that we can be advocates. Absolutely. 
Well, thank you so much, Caitlin, for the great work you're doing. Shout out to our, our folks from Passion tuning in and just really appreciate your work. Now we're going to hear from Kay Buck. Kay is the CEO and executive director of the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking. Kay, you all have been working on this for a long time, since 2003. Love to hear more about the coalition and about your work. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here. And oh, should I wait till I'm? No, uh, you're good. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm excited to be here as well. And you know, we just came from the president's speech uh, back to Los Angeles. That's where we're headquartered. Past is an organization, of course, that provides direct services to survivors of modern day slavery and works to end this human rights violation through a survivor-centered approach. And so what that means is that we partner directly with survivors in order to inform prevention strategies and also outreach strategies to identify more uh, survivors. And it was just such a thrill to be in New York City um, hearing the speech from the president and uh, having one of the survivors who's part of our Survivor Advisory Caucus uh, be recognized, Seema Matul. And um, we can't say enough how exciting it is to have these new initiatives. Uh, we're so grateful to the White House and to Humanity United and now to Goldman Sachs to really put survivor support front and center. Because not only are they, uh, do they need to be liberated from slavery and get the help that they so deserve, but also they're key partners to help us prevent this uh, both here domestically and globally. Thank you so much, Kay. It's uh, wonderful to partner with you, and it's so great to see so many of the things you all have been working on for years really bubble up on the on the uh, national forefront. Let's try Malika again. Malika, let's see if we can hear you this time, because we, we need to hear from you. You're one of our heroes. Are you there? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. We're still not getting your audio. Maybe someone there can, can help you out with that. Um, Otherwise, you know, hold some written pieces of paper up to the TV <laughs> screen. <laughs> All right, uh, to the computer screen. Let's let's move to some questions, guys. We, we, we're, we're getting a lot of good stuff from folks around the country on this issue. Um, one of them uh, just came in from Brandy at PLY32, if you guys want to follow. Um, Brandy says, human trafficking is so widespread. Why hasn't this issue been out more in the public up until now? Um, you know, what, what, why, why is this, has this not been on the forefront of the national conversation? Um, I'd love to, our administration's thoughts on that, but maybe we can go to some folks who've been working on this for a long time. Kay, you want to kick us off there, and then uh, Natalie can talk about the faith-based community's views on this? Absolutely. Well, I think one key reason is because, you know, it's really just uh, become a big issue in the United States domestically. And even today, when we're giving public presentations, which I do all the time, people still say, well, sure, this happened in Mexico or in Thailand, but it certainly doesn't happen here in our backyard in the United States. And so people are just now becoming aware that it is a, a huge problem here in the United States. In addition to that, um, it's the fear that so many victims have to reach out to law enforcement, but also to the general public. They are told over and over again by the traffickers that if they try to get any help at all, that their lives will be in danger and even their family members back home are threatened. So it makes sense that so many uh, survivors don't reach out because they're just so fearful of doing so. And I think it's um, just to continue on what you're saying, there's such an awareness problem and that's why this is so incredible that the President of the United States has called this out for what it is. He has named it as modern day slavery, which is incredible, incredible for people to hear because even when I was tweeting from the President's speech, so many people were responding to me saying modern day slavery doesn't exist, it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen in my community, maybe it happens over over there, wherever there is, but they don't think it happens here where they are. And so it's so important to continue to get the word out that this is happening and to find a way to give victims their voice back and mm -hmm. um, not to exploit their stories, but to give them the power to tell their stories, to give them their voice back that has been taken that would enable them to tell their story. And when someone hears from a true survivor of this, what their story is. It just gives so much power to the truth of the cause. Absolutely. Thank you for that. 
Um, we had a question that came in from the ACLU. How's the Obama administration going to enforce these new restrictions on government contractors and hold violators to account? Samantha, you want to talk a little bit about enforcement, how we're going to make sure that hold people's feet to the fire on this thing? Yeah, I mean, I would just say also in response to the last question, the 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 only good thing one can say about this issue is that the awareness raising has been taken on by such a bipartisan um, and diverse uh, community of, of people and an ever-growing, I mean, and here, Josh, I'll, you know, steal your thunder. I mean, the faith community has been unbelievable at just putting this out there and using the pulpit uh, where it matters most uh, for people. And in that vein, to the to the question, I think that um, the, la the last administration and the Clinton administration that originally signed the the Trafficking Act um, have always wanted uh, to make enforcement a priority, and we have struggled, uh, frankly, all three of us, um, to just get out to the the crannies uh, of our societies. This is speaking internationally of where our money is being, our taxpayer money is being spent, and what this is doing is it's put the, putting the onus on those who receive taxpayer money to show and themselves to scrutinize their bases, to show that they have plans for recognizing, for detecting, and for uh, obviously for punishing and, and, and taking uh, you know, punitive action against those who are in any way complicit. Uh, I think similarly in this country, I mean, um, the President and, and Valerie Jarrett and Tina and others have had long conversations with Eric Holder. And one of the things that he is is working very hard to do, the Department of Justice has worked very hard to do, is to create interagency task forces so that you have not only the Department of Justice active in this from a law enforcement perspective, but also the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the Department of Labor, you know, where, where, again, all of our agencies see this as something that they need to be uh, accountable for. And so as we move from the, the promises and the pledges of Tuesday into the nitty-gritty of enforcement and of actually bringing this to life and really cracking down, uh, we would welcome also your suggestions, agency or department by agency or department, or at a more macro level as to how we, we you know, sort of tighten the, the vice on people who are perpetrating this monstrous crime. Absolutely. Very helpful. Thank you, Samantha. we got a, a, a set of questions around, all in the same vein. McKinsey asked, our religion class wants to become involved. How can we? Uh, Hannah uh, Mullaney asked, what can American teens do to help? Hey, Caitlin, you want to you wanna take this one? How can young people get involved in this movement? Yeah, definitely. So a number of the NGOs who are fighting against human trafficking actually have ways for students to get involved. And the main factor is starting up what's called a justice coalition or a justice club on your campus, or even the youth. IJM works with the youth in um, middle schools and high schools as well. So teens um, can log on to their website and there's educational tools that they have there for students and handbooks to first get educated on the issues and the topics, and then to lift their voice and share that education. There's even curriculum um, that they can use and provide their teachers with to then teach in their classrooms or in an after school activity. Um, and also, there's, we found on our campus the main thing that students want is something to do. So we've really tapped into the passion and the energy that students have behind their personal gifts, whatever they're gifted at or talented at we've really called on them to step up and use their gift or talent to set others free. Um, and we've just asked them to take a stand for freedom by using whether it's they're passionate about cutting hair and using that as a donation way to give all the money to organizations such as Abolitionist International or IJM, um, or whether that's if they can paint. We did an art auction where you can just sell all your paintings and give all the proceeds to an organization that's fighting against um, trafficking. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Caitlin. So everybody can do something, no matter what your yeah. talent is, it can contribute to this cause. Hey, we got a question um, from Danielle Vermeer about what are the most effective incentives to companies to clean up their supply chains. Um, Tina, you do a lot of work on public-private partnerships. Randy, you do a lot of this work as well. Can you comment on, on how companies can get involved generally and what are the incentives we can create to get them in, in, involved in this issue? Well, thank you, Joshua. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's two levels. If you're, if you're at a company, 
Um, I think it is to serve a look, look at your supply chain. And we're hoping through the many partnerships we have to actually get more tools available to companies. Because we know there's some companies, they have very long supply chains. You've got you know, someone who's making one piece of the shoelace to add to the shoelace to add to the stitching that goes to the shoe that's, that's coming, coming over. And where do you find that out? And I know, you know um, Ambassador DeBaca and, and others here in the government are working with, with folks in the private sector as well, where we can actually tease out and provide data. And that's one of our one of our goals is to be able to give companies better data on where are, what are high trafficked industries, what are vulnerable industries. So um, you as a company will be able to target in your supply chain and go look. So you're not just looking for a needle in the haystack. You've got a way to go and target your efforts to the most high risk geogra you know, geographic areas or the most high risk kinds of industries that may exist in your supply chain. But I also want to speak to consumers because I think the other power of what can individuals do is really powerful because some people are going to respond to our EO, some people are going to want to step up to do the right thing, and there's some companies for whom, you know what, labor is cheap. That's why this exists. That's why this is a problem. Um, and, you know, there's cheap, cheap goods out there, and we like our cheap clothing, and we like our inexpensive, you know, um, gadgets, you know, and co as consumers, we have a voice. We have a powerful voice for saying what kinds of products we want to see and that we want to see products that that are come from from uh, manufacturers and marketers you know who are some part of this movement to make sure that they they are making their products and selling to them to us you know free of traffic labor um, and i think we we have a powerful voice to step up and be part of that and that is something that individuals we can all do in our own buying we can all do with our voice and speaking out that this is what we need and consumer sentiment will move markets in as many ways is even more powerful than what we can do, you know, by regulation or EOs or, or executive orders or, or anything else is consumers can move the markets in this direction. Um, and that's something I think everybody who's tuning into this Google Hangout can do. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Randy, you want to talk to the issue of public private partnerships on, on trafficking? No, that, that's great, Joshua. And, and let me just follow up on Tina's comment on this. I honestly, I think, uh, 10 years from now, when we look back at this era right now, the history will mark this as a moment in time when supply chains made dramatic uh, changes in terms of transparency. And it just seems there's an alignment taking place, both among NGOs at the, at the federal level and certainly at the commercial level, where, where people are either moving towards cleaner supply chains or there's absolutely no excuse anymore to not have clean supply chains. And so in terms of some of the partnerships that Humanity United has been funding, you can look at Verite, which has done some amazing work around audit standards of supply chains. I think uh, Business Coalition Against Trafficking is really putting a lot of pressure in terms of really trying to clean up the supply chains. And Slavery Footprint, which has really come out of the Trafficking in Persons Office, and Justin Dillon and his team are really providing great tools to better understand how many slaves have caught, you know, are, are enslaved to create the kind of products that we have in our supply chains today. So there's really no excuse anymore to not have clean supply chains. Absolutely. That's right. There is no excuse. So many groups doing wonderful things, not for sale and slavery footprint and, and so many others. I got to try Malika again because it would be a shame if we didn't hear her voice in this. We got a number of questions about how we can empower trafficking victims themselves to, uh, to be a part of and to help uh, be leaders in this movement, and in so many ways, that's what Malika Sadasar does. Get, Malika, look, we're going to try your mic one more time. You there? Oh, we're sorry. Okay. Well, we're going to maybe have to do a follow-up uh, uh, chat with Malika just to get her voice in the mix. Hey, we've actually gotten three or four questions about labor trafficking, both internationally and here in the United States. Obviously, sex trafficking is a horrible, horrible crime, but a number of folks are saying, and this is from Tiffany Williams and Giselle Rodriguez, uh, what can we do to get uh, to make sure that there's awareness about labor trafficking in hotels and restaurants and in other places? Anyone want to want to tackle that one for us? Um, how, how do we make sure that we're talking about labor trafficking? Well, I will say, and I'll jump in. Just one piece from what we're doing at the government level is part of the initiatives announced. Um, uh, on Tuesday included increasing training of our Federal Department of Labor wage and hour division employees. Um, and so these are folks who are going out and enforcing our existing wage you know, and labor laws but to make sure they're also um, fully trained and aware of looking for the signs of labor trafficking as they do that as part of our overall you know, labor enforcement efforts. Um, and then there are six, we have six pilots 
um, with a number of federal um, agencies as partnerships on you know anti an anti trafficking coalition teams, which will be an interagency collaboration um, between labor justice, um, our other criminal investigation and prosecution efforts, so that we're all aligned, you know, um, to try to both identify and then prosecute um, uh, these crimes. And if I could just add, uh, Joshua, one, one thing that the President didn't speak about in his remarks, but I think is significant, is that for the first time this year, the Department of Labor on the issue of child labor is actually assessing how a country is performing abroad, basically saying they're doing moderately well, they're doing well, or they're not, not doing well at all. And so that also is a form, just like the, the TIP rankings have been um, for countries on trafficking generally, that has the Department of Labor now measuring country performance and holding them accountable in ways that we think also can be useful. The uh, Amtrak uh, and other transportation initiatives that Tina alluded to at the beginning, it seems to me when we're, we're working with our own transportation associations to spot it, detect it, et cetera, these are the kind of skills we should also take on the road. And, and we, you know, the State Department and Lou have already had you know, a range of discussions with any one of a number of countries about you know, the, ensuring that those officials in those countries are also trained. And so we need to enhance and step up that collaboration, as you say, not just on sex trafficking, but on, on uh, forced labor of all kinds. Absolutely. Hey, let me go to some of our participants. Let me see if any of you have questions for Tina or Samantha for the administration. Or um, ideas. Or ideas. Yes, we need ideas. <laughs> so any, anyone want to jump in with any questions? I would love to ask just a little bit on the domestic side. Yeah. There's still um, between four and five states that don't have laws that are against sex trafficking. Um, in human trafficking, and so I'm just curious on a federal and national level if there's going to be any advancement in um, increasing the demand for states to really step up and have laws that outlaw human trafficking. It's a great well, question. Yeah, Tina, you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the other public-private um, partnerships um, that we've been working on is with the American Bar Association. And I have to give credit to, to my good friend, Laurel Bellows, who's the new president of the ABA. Um, she has made fighting human trafficking one of her signature issues for this year while she's president of the American Bar Association. And I know they are working, for example, on you know, model laws, you know, just that, as you referred to, Caitlin, you know, trying to develop the tools so that they, through their, their power of their networks, um, the ABA includes, you know, um, private practice lawyers, public sector lawyers, judges, legislators, um, through, their, through their network, they can get to those states um, with model laws um, that they can um, develop. And I think um, uh, we want to expand those kinds of protections. Because you're right, a lot of this is existing actually at the state and local levels when we talk about child welfare laws and we talk about you know, the, the sort of state, state prosecution of these crimes. Um, and so those, that's a place we need to attack. So I, I really want to salute the ABA for stepping up on that. Absolutely. Hey, one, one question we're getting a lot of, and thank you for that, Tina. That, that's helpful. And I think we're almost there, um, Caitlin, in terms of getting every state to the point they need to be in terms of their state legislation. We've gotten this next question from Michaela Seabach, from um, Kara Canna, um, and from many others. Um, in terms of, uh, Kara says, what about the guys that are being trafficked? Michaela Seabach says, you talk about girls being trafficked, which is critically important. Are there any boys and men suffering this, types of this type of slavery? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I was recently in, in Manila and spent some time with um, a, a number of men and women that were emerging from traffic situations. And it's a huge issue, uh, not just in the Philippines, but around the world. And you can be assured that um, while we have to tackle this for women and girls, and that's where most of the problem is, quite frankly, um, we, we are not forgetting about men and boys as a part of this effort. Does anyone want to speak to that, or is that something that, yeah, I, okay. I do, Joshua, yeah, that's a really great point. I, you know, I want to say that at CAS, uh, made just four years ago, our caseload of men was just 5%. Now it's 21% of our entire caseload. So it has increased dramatically. And I think that this brings up a lot of issues around service provision particularly in the area of shelter. And, you know, we uh, are fortunate enough at CAS to have opened the first uh, shelter for trapped women and their children, but we are still uh, utilizing homeless uh, shelters for our male clients, which is not at all ideal in serving this population efficiently. So um, I, I think that's one area that we really need to work on as an anti-slavery movement how to address the aftercare and the services that are so needed for men and boys. 
Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's something that we're, we still have more work to do. Unfortunately, we just have time for one last question, um, but we're going to um, uh, try to get answers from uh, each of the folks on the panel. Very, very brief ones, and then we're going to have to wrap up for today and continue this conversation in various formats in the future. A lot of folks have asked about prevention. What can we do to stop this problem before it starts to make sure that um, women and men, boys and girls, don't end up in trafficking situations in the first place? Um, uh, I think that has awareness components. It has service delivery components uh, can folks uh, talk about that how we can uh, how we can address the issue of prevention um, I'm gonna ask our administration folks to go last so you can help us close out mm -hmm. so um, let's talk about prevention somebody ju uh, someone jump in for us there yeah I think like I said before for students it's really raising our voice and educating our sphere of influence so as a campus chapter our main goal um, on our university's campus was um, to really reach out to other groups and we had the honor to um, reach out to churches and to other campus ministries and Greek life communities and other um, social justice or human rights organizations on our campus and really use that platform to speak and educate and I would say um, yeah even as just students and speaking on behalf of them we really believe that educating and um, awareness by getting out and letting people know is the main thing we can do to prevent it because once people know and can relate um, locally then they will reach out globally absolutely that's a great answer Caitlin thank you so much we're gonna move across the screen Kay how about you you want to talk you want to close us out here absolutely well we're fortunate enough to um, have a prevention project in Mexico and one of the things that has that has really helped is to work with local indigenous groups in the border states because they have so much expertise and knowledge in their region, uh, sometimes that's overlooked, looking at really grassroots groups and organizations and making sure we're partnering with them to uh, educate the community of the prevention strategy. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the northern states, um, the State Department, the U.S. State Department, has been giving out outreach materials through the local NGOs, and we're a part of that partnership. That's really helped to educate the community and is starting to put a dent in prevention. Next, I also want to point out what Tina was saying, is the, the partnerships, uh, the private and public partnerships, and making sure that consumers play a role in prevention. Every single person watching today is a consumer, and we have a lot of power as consumers. We learned that as we sponsored the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, and now we're seeing in California students who are consumers, soccer moms who are consumers, everyone really getting behind this law. And I think that's also a really important prevention strategy moving forward. Absolutely. Um, hey, Kay, how can folks get in touch with CAST and move forward? What's your website? CASTLA.org. Wonderful. Thank you. Malika, we're going to try one last time. You there? I am. Can you hear me? All right, finally. Apologies for all the, the struggle around this. Very briefly, the Human Rights Project for Girls is a human rights oh, oh, no. for young women and girls here in the U.S. and trying to map out the issues of trafficking for girls in the U.S. Mm. Well, friends, I'm going to say if you can Google the Human Rights and Project for Girls. So we uh, the, are so grateful. Hey, Malika, I'm sorry. Uh, if you if, if you can Google the Human Rights Project for Girls, Malika Sada Sar, she's wonderful. Let's make sure we find out more information about her. Um, Miami. Sorry. Joshua? Okay. And, uh, yeah. Joshua, we just want to give her her website. Would okay. that be helpful? Yes, so please. The, the website is uh, rights4girls.org. Right right. girlsorg Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kate. Hey, Natalie, close us out. Let's talk about how the Christian community broadly, um, and all communities of faith, Christian, Muslim, Hindus, and Jews, believers, and non-believers, right. how can folks get involved in this effort? How can we address prevention? Continue to raise your voice. I mean, that's the power that every single one of us has is the power of our voice. In the month of July, Abolition International held something we call the Freedom Month. It was 31 days of freedom. Wow. We reached over 2 million people. You know, just by people 
one by one, tweeting, Facebooking, this is a reality, this is happening. Continue to use your voice. Every person that is viewing this now, that is the one thing every single one of us can do, is use our voice to make this known as a reality. Second, as a faith-based community and as a, a church, we have to continue to raise awareness of the breakdown of the family because I believe that that is such a key component to why this is such an issue, is the breakdown of our families. And as a church and as a faith-based community, we have the opportunity to continue to address the reality of that and do what we can to do prevention from that side. Well, thank you so much, Natalie. You are certainly raising your voice, and we can't <laughs> wait to hear it more in the days ahead. Thank um, you. Let me get my website really quickly. It's <laughs> abolitioninternational.org. And I'll do one. Do you one more? It's at Natalie Grant for her Twitter account. So, hey, <laughs> thank you, Joshua. <laughs> hey, hey, Randy, uh, close us out from uh, from Humanity United's perspective. Hey, listen, let me let me uh, just uh, do a shout out to all my great partners here, and and from the perspective of a philanthropist, so many of these organizations operate on shoestrings, and we have just got to organize private philanthropy and donors together so we can drive impact towards these groups so they can do what they do. If you want impact as a donor or a, or a philanthropist, this is the place to get it done. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many other areas you can allocate your money, but if you want true impact, these four people, as well as many others, can drive impact. And so if you want to be a part of the Partnership for Freedom so we can aggregate our philanthropic capital, now's the time to make it done. And uh, let's join together in this kind of historic moment that's in front of us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Randy. That's a great call to action. Uh, Tina and Samantha, two of our anti-trafficking crusaders here in the White House, why don't you give us some final thoughts before we wrap up? Well, I'll, I'll go first and then over to Tina, but I just want to echo Randy's point. Uh, it is linear. <laughs> the amount of work we do means the amount of freedom expands in the world. It's, it's literally, that's there's like an algorithm, um, a, a truth algorithm there. And one of the reasons the, pre the president decided to choose CGI, the Clinton Global Initiative, as the place uh, to make these announcements and to deliver this incredibly impassioned appeal um, uh, and summons uh, was because the private sector was there. It was a way of getting the message that Randy just sent here on, the, on this chat you know, to a broad coalition of companies who, who really could get involved and to a number of private sector individuals. I just say on prevention on, from the foreign policy side, um, if, it is, if it is someone's job to combat human trafficking in the U.S. government, that is like one nameable individual or set of individuals, we're not doing our job. It's everybody's job, and it has to be mainstream. And, and I, I commend uh, Raj Shah and Secretary Clinton because they have basically sent that message into the development community and into the, the entire State Department, really. So it's, Ambassador DeBaca has done phenomenal work, and he's joined by the regional assistant secretaries who are responsible for Asia or for South America and you name it. Um, and so that's that's critical because ultimately prevention also is about these deeper structural challenges that we just have to get our arms around, um, you know, as a country in terms of our development assistance and so forth. Um, uh, economic development, literary uh, literacy efforts, you know, things that are so deeply ingrained and entrenched. We as a government have to make sure that we keep our eye on the prize in terms of overall uh, economic development. Um, and then I would just say that I think what the Department of Justice has done, which we talked a little bit about at the beginning, but stepping up prosecutions, uh, as we have managed to do, I think each of the last three years we've seen more prosecutions than any previous year of traffickers. Still, you know, probably not enough, not remotely enough compared to the scale of the problem. Uh, but you can see, again, with the Attorney General and others uh, focusing on this, the difference that can be made. Prosecution is itself a signal to perps and to the people who are trafficking people that there is accountability, and that itself is a form of prevention. And lastly, and here I'll, I'll tee up my great friend and colleague and, and co-conspirator in a lot of this, Tina, uh, the President also announced um, uh, the Equal Futures Partnership. The Secretary Clinton actually announced it. Um, and there, what we have, and this is specific to women and girls, uh, but a, a series of steps that we are taking and we're calling on other countries to take to enhance uh, economic empowerment and political participation for women and girls around the world. Because at the end of the day, unless you get you crack the code on those two elements, people are still going to find themselves vulnerable. Women and girls are going to find themselves vulnerable either on the back end of having been trafficked and, ha and actually coming out of, of that horrible experience or vulnerable to predators uh, of the kind that sadly uh, still roam the planet. Wonderful. Tina? 
So finally, I've just on, on a governmental level, um, I want to highlight that um, the part of the strategic plan that the president charged in his speech on Tuesday, all of us in the federal government to now work on, um, is to have a comprehensive whole of government plan um, that will include not only things like prosecution and um, supply chain and all the issues we've talked about, but also have as part of that prevention. And we will we are we are committed to doing that. Uh, but I want to end, and I'm going to challenge channel Malika a little bit because she's really the person who taught me this, and and was one of the one of the early Early people coming into the White House to, to, to teach us about this issue um, is I want to leave us with the thoughts about these individual survivors and the individual victims of, of trafficking. Um, and through Malika and, and through other folks at Gems and Fair Girls, you know, I had the privilege of meeting these incredible survivors. Um, you know, girls at Fair Girls here in DC who are just, you know, just blocks away from the White House where they've been trafficked and suffered from this. And, you know, I'm the mom of a 15 year old girl, so this hits home. And on prevention, you know, I think we got to support our young women and, and, and men. We have to be, we have to wrap our arms around vulnerable kids. We have to, kids who don't have self-esteem, kids who come from, you know, abusive homes, kids who are at, at, at risk of the traffickers. You know, kids go to the, get, get, get vulnerable, or vulnerable kids get identified and picked up by these traffickers because they don't have support systems um, elsewhere. And we need to provide those, all of us need to. Um, and that's the kind of prevention we need to do on a, on a real individual, human-to-human -human level. Um, that's the voice I think the president was trying to lift up those stories and those faces on Tuesday. And it's something we all need to keep doing in all the many ways in which you know we may you know encounter the, these these girls and boys. You know whether it's a big macro level at the federal government or if it's an individual level at kids we see in our own schools and neighborhoods. Um, so I, I think we all have a role to play there. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Tina and Samantha. Thank you to all of our participants and all the folks who hung out with us today on this Google Plus Hangout. I understand we're actually trending on Twitter right now, so uh, <laughs> to, so go pound WH Hangout. Listen, uh, I, I, this is a, a horrible problem that we're confronting as a world, but um, I can say that I have never felt more hopeful than I do right now, seeing that this is the whole of our community is really coming together around this issue. Faith groups and non-sectarian organizations, students and older Americans, government and the private sector, uh, we are all focused in a historic way on the issue of ending slavery. And I think we can reach that point together. Let's keep up the fight. Um, and I'm just going to close with a quote from President Obama's speech on Tuesday. Our fight against human trafficking is one of the greatest human rights causes of our time, and the United States will continue to lead it. We certainly will, but we're not leading it alone. We're leading it with all of you. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to working with you in the days ahead. Bye-bye, everybody.